Welcome to Wild Heart Revival, a gathering place for conversations and stories as pathways of renewal and revival. I am your host, Te Tayari, and today's guest is Rosemary Traumer. It was such a pleasure to roam the beautifully messy and tender rawness of life, love, and lore with Rosemary, as well as to discover how to see the world more creatively and meaningfully through a poetic lens. And unfortunately, during our conversation, my connection cut out two times, and Rosemary was incredibly graceful in holding that while I figured things out on my end. So there are going to be two points in the conversation where there's a bit of a wobbly transition, and that is why. Rosemary Traumer co-hosts Emerging Form, a podcast on creative process. Secret Agents of Change, a surreptitious kindness cabal, and Soul Writer's Circle. Her poetry has appeared on A Prairie Home Companion, PBS NewsHour, O Magazine, American Life in Poetry, on Carnegie Hall Stage, and on River Rocks She Leaves Around Town. Her collection, Hush, won the Halkion Prize. Naked for Tea was a finalist for the Abel Muse Book Award. Rosemary has been writing and sharing a poem a day since 2006, a practice that especially nourished her after the death of her teenage son in 2021. Find her daily poems on her blog, A Hundred Falling Veils, or a curated version with optional prompts on her daily audio series, The Poetic Path which is available on your phone with the Ritual app. She is the author of Exploring Poetry of Presence 2, Prompts to Deepen Your Writing Practice, and her poetry album Dark Praise Explores Endarkenment, available anywhere you listen to music. Her most recent collection is All the Honey. In January 2024, she became the first poet laureate forevermore and is helping others explore grief bereavement, wonder, and love through poetry. If you are intrigued by any of my other offerings, such as the personalized threshold counseling that I offer for individuals and couples, or if you're interested in reading my latest essays, simply visit coyotecouncil.earth. You'll find a direct link in the show notes. Additionally, feel free to subscribe to our monthly newsletter, which provides updates on new podcast episodes and other creative happenings. Now, I want to invite you to settle a little bit deeper into your body, to breathe more fully, and to open your heart to receive this conversation with Rosemary Traumer. Great. Um, and, the, and where I want to start is actually um, the topic of like poetry and poetic thinking or poetic orientation to life and the natural world, to the wildness of earth, and how that poetic thinking can actually connect us more deeply into our wildness, into our, into our nature. And so I have a quote here from you that I'd like to offer, and then we can get into that topic. And so you say, reading and writing poems about the natural world can invite a deeper relationship with the earth and teach us so much about what it means to be alive. And so how is it that poetry can deepen our connection with the earth and enhance our sense of being alive? Hmm. Okay, let's go all the way in. (laughs) Uh, to, To start, I suppose, let's be clear that not all poetry does. Yeah. This is something poetry can do, uh, and and the in the hands of some people, it's uh, it's inevitable to fall more deeply in love with the world. You know, I think about Mary Oliver or Wendell Berry or A. Yeah. R. Ammons, and I think about how I'm re- I read their poems, and because of their attention. And, and their intimate, their intimate relationship with the world, their willingness to be curious and 
to wonder that is infused into their poems. And then that, that goes, you know, that, that transfers, that transfers. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think for instance, uh, I'm thinking about A.R. Ammons has this poem about spring. It's called eyesight. I'll just recite it if that's okay. And then we can. Really? Yeah. So he says, um, eyesight. It was May before my attention turned to spring. And my word, I said to the mountains, I missed it. Spring came and went before I got right to see. Mm. Don't worry, said the mountain. Try the later northern slopes. Or if you can climb, climb into spring. But, said the mountain, it is not that way with all things. Some that go are gone. Mm. So here, Ammons has this conversation with the mountain right and he he comes to the mountain with a problem help the mountain has this kind of a, a couple of ideas but then also this the suggestion that yeah you do some things you miss you know mm -hmm. that there it is possible there he's got it's got this little moment of almost prophecy like if you don't if you don't meet it <laughs> you will lose it. So, you know, I just think about that kind of intimacy that Ammons has, that kind of actual, where he actually imagines the world talking back to him. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I, I love that. I love that as a, as a poet, I, I do it myself or I do it with kids, I, you know, where I go and have the kids I, choose anything, choose a tree, choose a river, choose a, choose a rock, have a conversation with it. And of mm -hmm. course you don't really hear it. Probably, but this willingness then to intuit, to yeah, know whatever part of us is rock or whatever part of us is river, and let that part come through, mm. and, and enter into this conversation in this way, uh, to to be open to that, to be into in, engaged in that kind of wonder. I think that there's the start, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderment. And also like, yeah, maybe you don't hear the, 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 the stone speaking per se, or the river speaking, but you can feel it. But at the same rate, like if the stone is big enough and it's a boulder and the wind is blowing past it, it's creating sound and symphonic resonance with the wind. And of course the river is always making sound and and so there is a sensuous experience of being alive in the moment, of course. And when you're in the, in more natural spaces, if you can open yourself up to that wonderment and that bewilderment of like, what is this really? What is the meaning that's here? Um, and I love that you're kind of like outlining the the possibility of having a more animistic orientation toward life through poetic thinking. Right. Although also, and, you know, word of caution, uh, yeah. danger as if, yes, I suppose it could be dangerous. You know, I think that the, the invitation that I feel myself again and again and again and again with poetry is to write something true, to write true. And I think that there can be an impulse. Certainly I have, I I have it myself sometimes to to want to write something wise or to want to write something good and um to to hear a voice and and to, to not hear the voice of it so you make something up because it sounds good. See, I think this is this is a danger, right? And and I think again, here's A.R. Ammons. He has a, a poem called Gravelly Run, in which he's going out into the world looking for something. Mm solace of some kind perhaps or wisdom of some kind and he he doesn't find it mm. and and in the poem at the end of the poem he says something i, I unfortunately i don't have this one by heart so i, I apologize to a.r ammons who's um probably looking through the veil saying oh please get it right sweetheart but i won't <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but i think but it's but the gist of it is this at the end of the poem he says something like there, there is no God in the holly, you know, hoist your burdens, 
pilgrim head on down the road. Like uh, sometimes I feel like the, there's a danger that we go out searching and we, we find what we want to find as opposed to finding what's really there. Yeah. And there's, I, I think as, as a writer then, as a poet, I, my challenge to myself is always what's really here. What's really here? What do I hope to find here? And being very aware of that. What is my expectation or agenda? Do I have one? Yeah. And how do I meet the world as cleanly as possible? Yeah. How how can poetry be a tool to meet the world in that more intimate, more transparent, more naked way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, some indigenous folks of the plains use this incredible metaphor of the hollow bone to to essentially um, hollow oneself out so as to be able to receive just more truth of the moment, to not be so filled up with stories and shoulds and looking for certain things, but to just hollow out and cleanse and clear and be naked and, and receive the truth. And I, I um, do counsel work with people, and something that I've been offering more lately to clients is this very simple inquiry, which is what is most true for me right now? Or a thought or a story comes up and to simply ask, is that true? Is it true? What is most true for me right now? And when I think about like, I've, I don't know if I'd call myself a poet, but I've written quite a bit of poetry in my life because I sense them. I know the medicine in it for me. And what you're speaking to, that process of like seeking to make it something, it always, like I've done that, you know, I've made things. And then it just, and especially later on, like maybe years later, I go back and read, I'm like, that's so made up, you know, <laughs> like it's, where's the soul, you know? And, and so I've noticed that process in myself and it's actually been uh, this interesting kind of block for me of where I've had to really meet parts of myself that feel like I need to make something be something, mm -hmm. you know? Like I'm, I'm creating something for a purpose rather than just for creation in and of itself, which then has its own innate self-generating purpose, you know? It's, it's a delicate balance. Oh, it is, Tay. I love that we're touching this because there's so much in it right now for me. I have a student who, just recently said, um, you know, why are we doing, you know, why does this matter? She'd written something. Why does this matter? Mm. And I know for myself that when that has happened, when I write something and I'm like, eh, what, so what? Mm. It's because I haven't done the real work yet mm. like that, of, in that poem. Right, that, that there's something in that poem. There's an there's an invitation there to touch the truth that I have not met. Because when we touch the truth, we never wonder why does this matter. That won't have, that that won't be part of it, right? Be, why not? Because we'll be so resonant with that glorious. <laughs> oh, that's what it is to be aliveness. Mm. There'd be no way to wonder. So what? Mm -hmm. So the, the this is a, I think just a great. Mm, uh, litmus test, right? For, you know, is the poem done? Which I don't even know if that's a question worth asking, but <laughs> is it ever done? But but to know that if if you have any sense of so what, that there's more there. And it's usually, like you say, if you take any line then out of your poem and you ask yourself, is it true? Yeah. And some part of you will have that sense of, oh, no, it'll thunk, right? Instead of ring. Mm. Just knowing then that our bodies too can be so helpful in a poetic practice. Know that that we. I'm sure you know too that sense of when you have touched it, you've you yeah. you and you. There's this aliveness, this charge that goes through us in mm. those moments. Not that every poem has it, and you know great measure, but to some degree, like the, the Emily Dickinson calls them the little bells, right? Maybe they're little bells, maybe it's a gong, but if if you don't, if, if at the end of it, you're like, eh, 
I mean, then maybe just walk away and say, thank mm -hmm. you for your service. I, I, I sat down, I showed up and, mm. or if you're like, yeah, there's something here, then coming back in and just really allowing yourself, like you said, to ask each, each part of your poem, is that true? Is that true? And mm -hmm. letting, so when I did this with my student, yeah, we looked at this one line. She's like, that's not true. Mm. She, she knew it right away. Mm. Right? It, it was it was like the pretty pink bow at the end of the poem that made it seem like it was all tied up. And it was just utterly not true. So yeah. then when she did the, oh, what's really here? Mm. This is the way we create a, a, a genuine relationship with the world through our writing, right? Is, is through that. You know, not the, I wish it would say this, or this is what I want to happen, or like you were saying, there's some kind of imposing that we do. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the, if it's not guided by the felt sense experience of the moment, because even like, you know, maybe we're writing about a memory or something like that, but if it's not guided by the, the sensorial experience of it, then could it even really be true? I wonder, right? Yeah, that's such a, I think about this a lot. This is so fun. Thank you for this. <laughs> yeah, for I'm sure. Talk about this all with you. You know, I think about how important it is. Yes, so important to bring up a memory, right? And to, to see how that's part of what created us. Uh, what fueled this moment was what that was. And to what to what end like why bring it up now like if if we just write about that moment as it was that that's a i call it reporting it's like a picture i don't know how helpful it is but if we think of it i like to think of it like um reflection the memory meditation what does it teach me now what's here now with it so that there are the two pieces right of that was then, and and what how what is the bridge then between what do I know now that I didn't know then, or what was present for me then that is coming back to open and flower for me now in a way it couldn't have then, you know, so that it that that relationship is exciting. That's when poetry I think it's exciting when we're writing about the past is what through this lens of the aliveness of the present. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I. I I'm involved in counsel work, therapy, mostly talk therapy online these days, given my lifestyle. And this is exactly really what I am noticing is so important when people are, when, when they're, I was going to say hung up on memories or pains from the past, which is really kind of what it is, you know, you're kind of hung up on something that happened in the past, you're fragmented and it's been that fragment is kind of lodged back in the past. And when we can bring it into the present, and I love this word presencing. So it's like we're sensing and being present in our sensorial experience while evoking this past memory, this fragmented aspect of self, being present with it. And that allows us to begin to, rather than dwelling on like, what was the story? It's like, well, what is it now? Mm -hmm. And how do we rework it or relive it or reimagine it in the now? Because we're very different people every yeah. moment, really. And especially if years have gone by, yeah. completely different person. So how do we relive that and reimagine it and re-embody it, um, transform it? And it makes me think of um, you, your TED Talk, actually, where you're talking about changing metaphors. And I really love that talk, by the way. Well done. And um, you're, yeah, so you're discussing how like certain metaphors are really kind of can be outdated and can kind of hold us into some almost like a rigidity of the past, like we're speaking to right now. Mm -hmm. and that it's really important to understand, first of all, to like see them for what they are. Like what, what are the metaphors that are guiding us and how do we understand how they're affecting our lives, our actions, our behaviors, our emotions? And then how do we take some kind of 
um, soulful self-authorship around reworking those metaphors for our benefit. And I'd love for you to explore that more, maybe even giving an example of some particular metaphors that you think are outdated or limiting, um, and then which that you find are empowering and transformative for you at this time. Right. Thank you for adding at this time, because they change all the time. Right? Yeah. <laughs> this is the thing is you're like we try on the new metaphor we're like oh that feels much much better and then we think oh <laughs> that, that it fit well it did and now it doesn't fit anymore you know i think um here's a poetic example um so uh there's a Danny Ladinsky has a version of Hafez. The poem starts, why, this is Danny Ladinsky's Hafez poem, why just ask the donkey in me to speak to the donkey in you when I have so many other beautiful animals and brilliant color birds inside, all longing to say something exciting and wonderful to your heart. It's just wow. a piece of poem. Why I just ask the donkey me to speak to the donkey in you? And when I read this poem, I remember being like, yeah, like, why be a donkey? Like, I just want to be fabulous. And <laughs> 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 Which, of course, feels great, like, to show up, you know, like, with all your feathers on until it doesn't, right? Until that you you realize you've put on all these feathers and they're so not true to this moment. Mm. And what do you, <laughs> now what do you do? Like, yeah. so, so I wonder, um, I think I, I've had this poem by heart for a long time, but let's, I'll try, we'll see what happens. But it's, it's a response to that poem. Dear, though I have come to you as many other beautiful, animals as long neck swan as persian cat though i have worn for you my most vermilion feathers and sung to you in the voice of the bird that always disappears just before it can be named and though i have come to you as tigress and as heron please do not refuse my donkey clumsy and stubborn all tug and bray gray and dull and smelling of dung. Of course you would want to turn away, but please, if you can, meet me this way when I'm awkward. Stepping on my own feet, yours too. Mm. Meet me when I am unlovable and love me then. Though I stink, though I'm not easy, nor graceful, nor lovely, but strong, and here I am, nuzzling your hand as it opens and aspiring to be nowhere but here, dear. We are nothing more than flesh for life to push through. And I'm done hiding inside the bright wings or even for that matter, beneath a done hide. It's only a heart touches another heart. Here, here is mine. Mm. No. I I, I shared that just because I feel like there's this longing to to change a metaphor and, and maybe we need to go back a few steps and talk about what is it to change our metaphors. But I think there's this longing to change the metaphor to make ourselves seem better and, wow. and to make life feel better. <laughs> and what if, what if the truest thing is to just continually shed it's I, I feel like the truest thing is to shed the frames, shed the frames, shed the frames. Oh, it felt nice to be a Persian cat. Oh, it felt nice to be a bird with vermilion feathers. Oh, well, it felt, you know, humbling to be a donkey. But is any of it, all of it, it's all just frames, 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 frames. What You know, how do we again and again touch the truest heart? We, we can't, we can't because, I mean, that's what language, all language is metaphor. All this is how you and I have a conversation right now is through this wow. language made of metaphor. And 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 so it's exciting and I love metaphors. I think that's it's thrilling. This is this is how you know Tay in Nicaragua and Rosemary Tromer and Placerville connect. And and 
and and then to see how limiting they are every one of them as exciting as they are they are they all have their limits so knowing that each one does its very best to point to the heart of it but none of them ever get to <laughs> that they're all um they're all just doing their best <laughs> that's all a metaphor can do sweet friend are you frozen i'm afraid you so are so funny too because you're like here we are Taze in nicaragua <laughs> and, you know, here I am, and then and we're able to connect, and then boom, it's all gone. Oh but, my um, god! <laughs> oh, we'll see if the internet is stable on this. I hope so. Um, okay, so we were talking about metaphors, changing metaphors. You're talking about the beauty that all language is metaphor. It's amazing because it allows us to co-create the moment together. But where were you going with that then? Let's see. So then, by the way, you froze with the most beautiful smile on your face. So that was. Oh yeah. <laughs> it doesn't always work that way. It can be so strange. But you, you looked beatific, uh, fully angelic. Uh, that's good. So, so just thinking then, I suppose about how metaphor is an it's an invitation always to choose a new frame, and also to to continually remember to not trust any frame even the ones and maybe even especially the ones that feel good because we'd like to cling mm. to those, I suppose. So if for people who are new to thinking about language this way and how they, how we all use metaphors, you know, I think often people will say, Oh, you know, you, you're a poet. Of course you think of metaphors or I don't know how to think of metaphors, but they're in all of our language. You know, we say, you know, what I, I, is, is something as simple as I'm feeling up, you know, and just noticing that that directional, that directionality is in there or um uh, you know i think a lot about the language of of illness i'm going to beat this cold i'm in a war yeah. against cancer uh, i'm going to fight. fight this yeah so just noticing that kind of language and how is it is it helpful maybe it is maybe it is but maybe it isn't you know is, is there another way to think about i I'm going to dance with this. I'm going to um, I'm, I'm going to be remade, but I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that there's just noticing the metaphor and then saying what else is possible. It's hard to hear yeah. the metaphor at first. And, and, and this is part of why I feel like it can be so helpful to write poems is because when we're writing mm -hmm. poems, sometimes the, with it there in black and white in front of us, we're like, Oh, Oh, mm -hmm. I see. Just this week. Uh, I was reading a poem with someone else and the poem was about loss, the inevitability of loss. And the end of the poem offered no, there was no hope at the end of the poem. <laughs> and she says, I just want something I can hang my hat on. Oh, sweet Tay, have you frozen again? Hi. Hey. <laughs> okay, the power is back on. <laughs> Thank you so much for your patience. I love that you're still here. Wow. You know, I've got plenty to do. So I just figured you'd right. show up. Yeah. And start again. So, yay. <laughs> okay. Um, wow. I like moved spaces. I came back here. Here we are. Okay. So we're really fragmented now. And that's okay. It's the nature of it. Um, you were about to talk about, I think, a poem or something that you read recently about loss. And I was yes. like right there, ready to receive it. So if Here. you can remember. I think okay. I got it. I think okay. I do. Uh, we were listening for metaphors. We were listening for metaphors and language and trying to see how, how do we hear the metaphor? How do we allow ourselves to know that that, oh, there there was there was the metaphor is that the metaphor that's going to work for me now yeah right so and everyone can do this not just because i'm a poet no just because it's right there it is so yeah. here we were we were reading this poem about loss and how we lose everything and then the woman said at the end of the poem i just want something i can hang my hat on mm. There it is, right? Here's this little hat. I just want something I can hang my hat on. And can we do that? Like, is that even possible? Just noticing that there's that phrase, I want to hang my hat on something 
that, that there's this longing for there to be something solid enough yeah. that I could put <laughs> that on it and, and it'll stay there instead of just falling to the ground. Mm -hmm. So I wrote uh, a poem, this is just a poem from a couple days ago that plays with, th th that takes the metaphor then and says, okay, that there's the metaphor. And then once you hear the metaphor, now you can, now you can push it. Now you can play with it until it breaks. So uh, if you're okay with this, I'll share this poem. Absolutely. Does that. Okay. So it's called After Talking About Vulnerability. I just want something I can hang my hat on, she said. But the mortarboard didn't hang on education. The government's white wig fell off. The tiara slipped from beauty. The skull cap blew off the church. No hat she hung could stay. The ball cap fell off the firm body. Art couldn't keep the beret. Even the mesh net of the beekeeper's wide brim fell away, fell away. It all falls away, which is to say nothing stays. Not the dodo, not the dino, not the houses we live in, not our firm young skin, not a father, not a son. Not sunshine, not rain, not empires, not cats, not the first crushing fist of heartbreak, not nightmares, not bruises, not hats. We let ourselves drift in what was left, head bare, hands empty, heart open, eyes wide. The sun stroked her shoulder. She breathed in the musky scent that arrives on the wind just before spring. Nothing was certain. She stood alone at the edge of every possible thing, no hat in hand, and listened to the chickadee sing. Yeah, that last line, no hat in hand and listen to the chickadee sing. This, this ability to be able to hold joy and sorrow at the same time and to honor both of them. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more than the other in one moment, but, but never letting go of either of them because you really just can't. So, so we just need to honor that. And that, yeah, I mean, when you begin to touch the truth of change, which is the fundamental, um, one of the absolutes of life, you really get faced with that, mm -hmm. that knowing um, the invitation to learn how to hold joy and sorrow together. Yeah. And um, I have another quote here from you that I'm being reminded of now that our conversations come to this point. You said, what do joy and grief have in common? The ability to evoke feeling that pushes us and opens us and helps us to be compassionate and helps us fall in love. And somewhere else you said, it matters the story that we tell ourselves. Nowhere has this been more profoundly evident for me than around the death of my son. I wonder if you would care to share a bit more about that relationship between joy and grief and how it's informed your, your personal life and your poetic explorations. Um, and I wonder if you brought the, that poem with you today the one is it called the invitation yeah this is this is a lovely segue into that actually yeah. because it's still around the same idea of the frames right what stories are we telling ourselves yeah. can we see the story that we're telling ourselves and once we can see it we can question it is this serving me is there another possibility and um for people who don't know um, my son did choose to take his life about two and a half years ago. And it did change everything. You know, it, it's, um, it's a, it's in the moments when our world completely falls apart, what we thought we knew about our world, what we thought we knew about our relationships. The, when, when, um, when the heart breaks so utterly, I do think, Tay, there is this opportunity then, <laughs> opportunity, 
there's an inevitability, I suppose, that because it, I don't know about you and I don't know about anyone else who's listening, but when when my heart broke open that much, there was zero, pretty much zero agency happening. It wasn't like I was looking for opportunities. Mm. Right? I was just barely making it from one second to the next second. Yeah. And in that spacious place, really, like I feel like that's that's... I think back to those, especially those first days, those first months about how, how everything had opened up completely then because there was, there was nothing, there was nothing to put the hat on mm -hmm. and how, how it was then that grief became this opportunity for love to rush in. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have known it to the level I know it now if, without this experience, right? But but when ever, when the walls all fell, it was love that rushed in to the to to fill all that space. It, it was a, so embodied that feeling of I, I mean I felt it in my body. I felt this love come and rewrite me. Literally felt like that was what was happening. Mm. And and so it is that in those first days that this poem that I'm about to share with you, I wrote the two nights after he died. Wow. And my husband and I were, you know, we were at an airport, actually hotel about to go home. And I didn't, I hadn't, I couldn't sleep, you know, I would just lie there. And, and I was aware in that sleeplessness of this story that I'll talk about in the poem and how that story shifted. I'll let the poem tell this. It's called The Invitation. Two nights after he died, all night I heard the same one-line story on repeat. I am the woman whose son took his life. The words felt full of self-pity, filled me with hopelessness, doom. And then a voice came, a woman's voice just before dawn, and it gave me a new shade of truth. I am the woman who learns how to love him now that he's gone. Mm -hmm. It did not change the facts but it changed everything about how I met the facts. Over a hundred days later, I am still learning what it means to love him. How love is an ocean, a wildfire, a crumb. How commitment to love changes me. It changes everyone, invites us to bring our best. Love is wine, is trampoline, is an infinite song with a chorus in which I am sung. I am the woman who learns how to love him now that he is gone. May I always be learning how to love like a cave, like a rough-legged hawk, like a sun. Mm. that poem i suppose is very aware of the shifting metaphors right today love is an ocean today love is a crumb today love is a you know sun is in sun in the sky you know it's a cave <laughs> you know and, and I, I remember i i had an email a few months ago from someone who wrote to me and said please tell me how is love like a cave yeah <laughs> How, what is that supposed to mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, well, you know, it, think of it that you go into this this space and into the into the earth itself, and you are so surrounded, you know, in mm -hmm. wound and mm -hmm. and that kind of protection from elements and that kind of you can't see anything, but but you feel completely surrounded and all your other senses are so alive you know just you know it, it, this is the glory of metaphor i suppose is that it could 
I say that's what cave means to me, but it could mean something so different to you. But this was an important practice for me after Finn died. I was so aware of how minute to minute grief was so different. Mm. And I started a practice of just writing. I, I didn't write a poem. You know, I've had a daily writing practice since 2006. The, after Finn died, I didn't write poems for seven weeks. And, but I was aware of them kind of coming and going. I didn't have the energy and I did, I didn't want to crystallize it. You know, in a way a poem crystallizes things and I didn't want that. I just wanted to feel, I just wanted the purity of feeling. I just wanted it to come through me and not mm. try to make it as we were talking about earlier. I didn't want to make it into something. Right. And But I was aware, and especially later than, you know, today grief is, today grief is a chair. You know, today grief is a shadow that follows me. Today grief is, you know, and, and I could just, an, an eraser that's taking away what I thought was here. Today mm -hmm. grief is, and just noticing how the, the flavors of grief were so different moment to moment to moment to moment and uh, and very consciously noticing that metaphor change yeah yeah and and love also and love also side of that always changing and love also what i didn't know tay before this was how possible it is to love someone and that the relationship does, doesn't end when they're dead that <laughs> it doesn't that there is still some there are still very vital ways that a relationship changes that love changes between well I'll say I'll just speak for myself between me and my son and I can feel that love continue to grow continue to change it's, it's not a static thing it's not a dead thing it's mm. this revolving thing mm -hmm. so that, that's really what is at the heart of this poem right may i always be learning to love may i always be learning to love mm. i am the woman who learns how to love him now that he's gone you know the the beauty of yeah. that love not dying when his body did. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Did you, have you sensed an expansiveness of that love when he left his body? Did it, did that love rather than being, you know, focused on him as a body, have you noticed that it's expanded in some way? Um, let's see how to answer this. It is very difficult to put language to it, but yeah. I will try. <laughs> and to say too, Tay, that it's different all the time. Truly, yeah. like it's different all the time. But we could say this: there was a moment when I, I, I had many experiences of him, you know, showing up in certain ways, not in very surprising ways i suppose but i remember being comforted by that and 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 the love itself it, i think by, by expansiveness i think i understand what you mean and in, in, in that it it was no longer so focused on a body it it was diffuse mm. and, and so that it could be anywhere mm. um i do have the sense that the that i can find him in everything which is mm -hmm. the maybe what you're saying but also, and maybe this goes back to what we were saying before about what's true. Is that true? Is that true? There was a moment I remember when I was lying there and and kind of reaching out, you know, are you there? Are you there looking for him, right? Out, out there in, in anything, in everything. And, and then <laughs> it was like a little knocking in my heart inside in my heart i say but really like an inner knocking 
-hmm. knock, knock, as if to say, not out there, mom, mm. in, in here. Wow. Always here. Like I had, it was, a, it was a beautiful shift day when I stopped looking for him and everything, this act of looking, where is he, where is he, where is he? And had this abiding trust right here, right here yeah. with every. cell of me with every bit of my being yeah. that kind of communion and connection that doesn't require a looking out mm. that requires nothing actually that requires nothing mm. it asks nothing of me it's just here yeah mm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. No, you, well, you, I saw you finding another thought there. You can please go ahead. No. It's no. Okay. Because I really appreciate the the humble simplicity of, of that. Of, and it, it is interesting how it relates back to what we were discussing at the beginning of this seeking to make something out of our experience. Um, like really kind of grasping at life rather than just letting it come to us, hollowing out and just receiving it. And as you're describing here too, the more that you can just turn within and be present with what's here within you rather than looking without that there is actually maybe the greatest intimacy that you could experience or that anybody could experience by actually touching the center of our being and not grasping at the forms outside of us or going to the formless within and just resting there and seeing yeah. what truth resides there right now. Yeah. Beautifully said. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the heart's capacity to feel, but also the heart's capacity to, to simply just hold, to be like a holding vessel for the immensity of feeling for the immensity of experience in life. It's just consistently blowing me away, blowing my mind, my thinking mind that, you know, can't comprehend how, because like a heartbreak will happen and it feels like it's this unmendable experience, you know, or this, this, like, I can't even, I can't even understand the pain and it's because I really can't, and it's not really necessarily meant to be understood. Like that, that's the lesson that I've learned um, over and over again, <laughs> which is that to think my way through some kind of heartbreak or pain or tragedy or even a difficulty, it's only going to get me so far. And I don't think it ever really gets me to that threshold of what feels like an initiatory experience of becoming more, becoming more whole, reaching that threshold of where there's a potential to be, to be more whole, to, to hold more. Um, and it's this very illogical, nonlinear, um, shapeless, but immense experience. Yeah. yeah, shapeless but immense. See, here, here is, again, um, lis listening for this metaphor, and this is one that's come up for me again and again, <laughs> that I get to like engage with and play with. It, it's something you said, and it's something that I 
often have said myself, you know, that the heart can the heart can hold it all, right? And and I remember then this is just shortly before Finn died, that I was trying I was very aware of trying to hold it all and how right. much was being held, how much sorrow, how much fear, how much love, how much all of it, all of it, all of it, all of it. <laughs> so I had this um uh, image of myself as a vase, right? And I'm trying to put in all the different flowers uh, and it's getting harder and harder. And I just keep thinking, can I get, I'm going to get bigger and bigger. I'm going to become more and more spacious to hold it all. Mm. Then I talked to my teacher, Joy Sharp, and she said, are you sure you need to hold it? Mm. Oh, friend, it was so beautiful that moment when yeah. I realized this this was the metaphor. I'm holding it all. I'm a vase. I'm a vessel. Mm. The moment I realized, oh, there it is. It's like it just went away. It just went away. Mm. And suddenly I didn't have to hold it anymore. It, it, the energetics of this were enormous. And they are every time I remember this. I do not have to hold it. I don't have to hold it. It requires That's requiring something. It was a lot of effort. To hold it. Right. I don't have to hold it. In fact, I just have to meet it. And honestly, I don't even have to do that because it's going to come and meet me. Like what's actually required of us is so little. Right. It's so little. And then to think of it, think of the self maybe more as a sieve, right? That it comes and it meets us and it passes right through. And this is kind of the miracle that I... You know, this is why today grief is, today grief is, today love is, today love is. Knowing that anything that meets us, the love, the grief, whatever, it meets us and it's whatever it is and it passes through and it meets us again and it's something else and it's something else and it's something else. Like we're just, what's asked of us is so little. It's so yeah. beautiful. <laughs> this revelation for me has been so life-changing you know, I think it's a constant letting go of, of A, the metaphor of the holding, but B, letting go of, of thinking that I need to do anything yeah. you know, to, to do okay. this. Um, so there it is that, that, like you said earlier, this, this amorphous, expansive, spacious formlessness. Yeah. And maybe for a moment we hold in the vessel of our bodies and shape it, but then it moves through. Then it moves through. Yeah. Again and again and again. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, thank you for that reframe. I think that that's really important. Um, it's amazing the subtleties in our language, and and what is truly supportive in the way that we're storying about our experience in our life and mm -hmm. each other in the world. But yeah, you're reminding me. I was I read a book by Joan Halifax recently, Being with Dying. And one of the things she talks about is this orientation that you could call bearing witness, or that's what she would call it, bearing witness. Um, Jack Cornfield also speaks of this in his own way. He calls, he says, taking the one seat. Hmm. Really what you're speaking to too, which is that actually life is going to come to you. Yeah. And all that you need to do is simply be present for it. Take the one seat. Find your place and just and just allow it to come. Don't hold on to it. You don't need to do anything with it necessarily, but to just simply witness it, to bear witness to the truth of what is. Yeah. To trust that that then, if you're simply receiving, that the the natural wild wisdom of your being will just know how to respond if it needs to at all. If it needs to at all, and that that life itself will rise up in through you to meet it yeah you know i just think that the the more i understand how little is asked of us the more astonished i am you know the more i realize how <laughs> excuse me that love life itself moves through us to meet itself mm -hmm. That, I guess it doesn't mean that we just don't do anything. It's not quite what I mean. It's not quite that. But it, 
I mean, obviously I do, I do a lot of things. I, you know, I, I, I go for a walk. I, I make food. I, you know, like we do things. We don't just lie on a couch, but to know that in the most difficult moments that through no effort of our own life will rise up and move through us to help carry us in that moment. I really I have felt that so profoundly. Yeah. And trust it now so much too. Mm. Mm. Oh. Hey, I have a poem about this. Let's see. Is it okay if I take a second to find it? Always, yeah. Well, I'll just say while you're finding it, it it's reminding me of this um really profound and simple teaching and understanding of like life breathes us yes like we aren't breathing even though you can think you're taking control of your breath by doing breath work and whatever tending to your breath purposefully but ultimately you don't have to that life is simply just breathing through us that thoughts are thinking through us that emotions are emoting us you know that um Love is loving us, loving through us. Grief is grieving through us. That we are simply just this incredible, dynamic, alive instrument that's just being moved by the flows of truth, really. And the more that we get into the thinking mind and distort it, the further away we get from the simplicity of simply allowing things to move us naturally. And this is really being with what Tao is called, being with the Tao, being with the flow of things, like trusting that there's an intelligence and a wisdom to creation and that we are inherently a part of that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so there doesn't need to be a force. There's this sense of Wu Wei that Taoists talk about, which is this non-effortless action, that we can take action without needing to do anything necessarily. And so this is what you're reminding me of. I, I need to consistently remind myself that I'm a student of simplicity yeah. because I have spent so much of my time trying to figure things out and creating so much complexity up here in my, in my thinking mind and to remind myself of actually it's the simplicity where all things flow through. Yeah. Um, please do share the poem if you found it. I did, I did. But let's just honor that it's complex too. Right, it is. It's simple yeah. and it's good. Hello, paradox. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's all of that. I, I, it's all of that serves you. I don't doubt it for a second. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love how what you just said too about this brings us back to that hollow bone, the hollow bone you were mentioning earlier. Yeah. Um, let's see. Growing trust. Now, since I've tasted trust in life. Why would I ever slip again into armor? The armor of an insincere smile, sometimes as dangerous as the armor of a sword. Why would I ever try to know what to say, how to act, how to plan, when, with zero effort of my own, life itself will move through me, will rise up in me to meet itself. Of course, like the child I am, I forget this trust. I slip back into habit, believe I need protection, fear I am isolated. But I have fallen in love with life at a time when that might seem impossible. And this strange fact alone seems enough to remind me to ditch the armor, mm -hmm. to cast wide my arms, to unsheathe my heart and say, yes, life, I trust you. I serve you. Why would I not trust life? It would be like a seed evading the rain, like a sunflower just unfurling, trying to avoid the sun. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Why would I not trust life? I guess there's a lot of reasons, right? You think there's a lot of reasons. 
how could I trust life when, you know, when my son took his life? How could I trust life when my, you know, this person was killed? How could I trust life when there's war all around us? How could I trust life when? Yeah. Yeah. So we come up with the reasons not to trust life and to think we need the armor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that funny? Like every poem today, everything we talk about just keeps coming back to, can you shed it? How, how much can we shed? How simple can it get? How naked can it be? And I I think it, the, to me, that's, that's what poetry does, is it has this ever-present invitation to, to, <laughs> to see past the frilly, dresses to see past the armor to see past the the pretty blossom to see past the crash yeah and and touch the truth that we're always circling 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 yeah. i mean i don't think we get to stay there i i haven't gotten to you know i think we get to touch it and, but then you know it to know it once i think is to know it forever like you can't unknow yeah. And so every time we touch it, we're like, oh yes, and that whole that whole like body tune turned into tuning fork, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it allows you to orient your life more toward that truth too. You know, the more times that you're able to touch that that part of yourself and know its its power and its potency and how real it is how guiding it can be then then other when other when life happens in the way that it does and it's spiraling nature and, and brings us into challenges or difficulties or confusions or we come up to obstacles or choices that we can touch back into that memory at least mm -hmm. and be guided by that truth even if we touched it only for a moment because then that can inform us of like okay well I know that it, I tend to raise my voice when I'm in an argument with this person, but I've touched the truth once before that when I'm able to meet them with some clarity and calmness and some ca compassion, that things are a little bit more smooth. So, okay, I'm gonna make that choice now. And, and it's like this compounding effect, but we really do need to seek it out too, I think. And so I think this is maybe where um, the practice of writing poetry or at least beginning to um, see the world through some kind of poetic lens can really begin to invite us more and more into those kinds of experiences of, of touching the truth of our being. <clears throat> so then to say, that the poem itself, right? I feel like the practice is the the sitting down or standing, I suppose it doesn't matter if you're sitting or standing, but the showing up, the showing up with a blank page. That and then and then the wondering what is here? What is yeah. here? What is yeah. here? What's the next true thing? What's the next true thing? So this I feel like is the real practice poem it matters of course but it's the byproduct of the real practice which is showing up and wondering again and again what's here what's here what's outside what's yeah. inside and the poem is a bridge between those two worlds mm -hmm. so that we have again and again this opportunity to connect in the inside of us with the world all around us and in this way Right to, to know our own belonging, to know how connected we are to everything, to everything. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone, <laughs> to everyone and everything. And and I, that's, I think, why poetry has this power, this power to, to open us, to connect us, to infuse us with aliveness. Yeah. But it's mm -hmm. not poems it's themselves really right like i just i feel like it's important to really honor what the practice is which is showing up with wonder with curiosity with openness with spaciousness with 
a love of mystery mm. that we will mm. never ever yeah well, i don't know but maybe yeah. some of us will but i i think that we don't get to, to see it all we don't get to know it all we don't you know but to to step into the wonder of it again and again and again and then put ourselves in that stream and get carried away by it and thrash around in it and float on it in the sun sometimes. <laughs> yeah. oh, this has been such a heartwarming conversation. Thank you so much. I, I know you need to go. and I wonder if you have time to share one more poem. Yes. And, yeah. If you do, I would love it if you brought it, the holding your heart poem. Yes. I think that would be such a nice way to tie this conversation up. And I'll say this was a poem I wrote in response to a piece of art. Oh, okay. Um, cool. And if you go on my blog, you can see the art too. I'm forgetting the name of the artist. Forgive me. Holding your heart. I want to trace the rings of your heart, the way I would trace tree rings, not to count them, but to honor each season of you. I want to touch my fingertips to your scars, I want to learn your heart's stories, find clues of how you became who you are. I want to press my palms to your heart and praise how it is we grow, even in disaster, even in drought want to praise the dark center, the time-thick bark, the record of the ordinary days. I want to chart the thin slivers of your wounds and let my hands speak love. want to tell you in a language of quiet touch, I see you. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank so you. Yeah. Yeah. Just so happy we got to make this happen. Um, how can people find you? You have your website. Is there anything you want to direct people toward? This will be released probably in April. So if you have anything to invite mm -hmm. people into, please do. So if you want to receive the daily poems, I do most foolish thing i send out my first drafts in the world every day <laughs> so you can receive the poems in your inbox um, or find them online at my blog which is a hundred falling veils.com that's all spelled out a hundred falling veils.com you can see any kind of upcoming programs on my website which is wordwoman.com and i have a, a daily poetry app so on your phone you could go to ritual and um the app, ritual is the name of the app it's a well-being app and the program is called the poetic path and i read a poem every day and wow. share some ideas about how people could launch into their own writing or not really the ritual is just to listen and notice what rises up in you as you listen oh that's lovely great okay well, thank you for your rawness. I really appreciate your vulnerability today and just showing up and being with what is and allowing the truth of our togetherness to create beauty. Yeah, thank you, Tay. Thank you so much. What a joy this has been.